Hey, Brian, it's Alyssa here. I, I know you don't know me. And I'm going to do my best to keep this video letter to you short and concise because I, I read that you're a, a PhD student, so you don't really have a lot of time, I'm, I'm assuming. But I'm, I am also going to try to not sound like a rant. So hopefully you've gotten my email and that email sparked a little bit of interest. So what I'm going to explain to you is that my mom has a movement disorder, but when I listened to Ardham Pataputian speak at Scripps in 2018, his uh, video around 33 minutes said that there's quite a few people that have been diagnosed with a movement disorder, but when they get their gene sequenced, they found out that they're a sensory um, processing order, a disorder. So when I heard that, I thought I can have my mom's genes uh, sequenced. And so we did. Well, we found out what medications worked well for her or not. But when I wanted to have the uh, um, trip transient um, receptor potential, oh, I think I got that wrong, TRP, receptor superfamily um, uh, sequence, that there wasn't anything. There also wasn't anything with the PZO um, one or two. So if those stretch gated ion channels can't be tested, how can I find out if my mom has a sensory deprivation, a sensory disorder um, that not only I think caused her pain for a good portion of her life, but also took away the ability to walk. So this is a video to ask you as a PhD student and working at Tasha Stanton's lab, can, can we start thinking in a little different direction? And if we can do that, maybe I can just share some information with you about why I think it's important for maybe you and Mark Rutland to get together and talk about um, tribology. I, th I think that is a good key for helping the public understand when things do or do not slide together properly, there's a whole cascade of chemical and electrical signals that are or are not happening. So let me do my best to try to play out a little bit of that information here and hopefully I'll achieve my goal. Okay, so wait just one second. Okay, so before I begin with my information thing, um, I, I'm not this strange, weird person from Sweden, American talking to you from Sweden. Uh, about shit I don't know, um, but I'm not a researcher. I I'm just somebody that works with people in, in pain, and I saw my mom go through a, a lot, and I don't want that anymore. So Holkan and Francis McLone have really set the stage for, for how light touch can affect our brain. Um, so, uh, but then also we have, um, oh, I know you have plenty of these books, but um, all about the mechanoreceptors. So uh, Martin Grunewald from um, uh, Germany, and I can't read German, but he has a great book, Homo Hapticus, that I've, I've heard about, but I don't read German. But here in this, there's a whole section on the anatomy of uh, mechanoreceptors and, and muscle spindles, which in Swedish, muscle spindles means uh, um, muscle spider, which is kind of funny. They're, they're not muscle spiders. Uh, do you mind if I just read to you a section? Because if you're watching, then yeah. Yeah. So here's my anatomy of receptors. Um, bothers my husband to no end that I write in my books. So muscle spindles, the perineum, the, the perineurium, for the perineurium, sorry of the supply and nerve is a continuation of the arachnoid matter and extends into the capsule of the muscle spindle, explaining the assumption that cerebrospinal fluid can be found within the muscle spindles. So um, your uh, mentor, Laura Mosley, was uh, at um, NCCIH in the United States when they turned 20 years old and he gave the keynote lecture and there was Alexander Chesler and um, Medina Patek, 
at the lab. And they, Medina's uh, lab, a hot hex lab at University of California in Irvine, has this um, microscopy where they fluoresce uh, certain areas. And so in knockout mice, they can see that PZO1 is not active because they've knocked it out. Well, th these cells are always moving. And, and they're like, wow, these cells are always firing in the right people because they're getting stimulation because other cells are moving beside them. And this tribology idea, this is what I want to share with you eventually, but I had to explain to you that I'm not just this crackhead um, trying to uh, say, hey, listen to me. Um, I'm just trying to find a way to explain to people why it's good not only to move, but why it's good for them to do their self-care. And it doesn't have to be going to the gym for an hour. It can be something as simple as taking their um, melt ball, which I don't sell tools. I I'm not selling, I'm not selling, I'm not selling. Or, or taking a roller and using it behind their back where they're putting pressure on these mechanosensors. The mechanosensors are then changing that pressure into a chemical and electrical signal that their body understands. And then their body can make the decision. But it's activating, it's activating those mechanoreceptors. And when we're doing a stretch or yoga, we might not be pushing so much on, on the right area. Now, the next thing is about fascia. And I'm sharing a screen with you from David Lasondek's uh, recent uh, podcast. And you're like, who's David Lasondek? Um, Lasondek. Yeah, I, yeah. Um, but I want to share something with you because when it comes to you and Tasha Stanton's uh, lab and more people coming into this idea about um, pain, I, I think this might be something that interests you. Um, so let me see, how do I share my screen? <laughs> Technical difficulties. Uh, there we go. Let's do it that way. All right. Yeah. I'm sharing my screen. So here's body talk with David Lasonduck and he's talking to Katarina Fede and she's at the university of Padua in the neuroscience department, along with Carla Stecco. And Carla Stecco has done some incredible work with dissection of the human form and finding out how the superficial fascia and the deep fascia intertwine, but also about different hormones in them. And don't know if you're going to be able to hear this, but um, around 18, yeah, at around 18 minutes, uh, Katerina talks about how temperature changes um, can it be affected by the superficial fascia? And this is not her idea. This is my idea. Is that if the tissue changes, just like climate friend, uh, climate change, it's a slow process. And when that changes, the mechanoreceptors change. This is my information. And if mechanoreceptors are changing or being deficient, then what other signal does a body have? And the most ancient signal is probably pain. So are people that are in chronic pain feeling pain because that's one of those signals that will probably never leave us, nor should it ever because it's protective, like you and Laura Moore Mosley has talked about. So I'm, I'm going off a little bit on the tangent, but um, around 18 minutes, Katerina talks about stress hormone cortisol. And the reason I wanna bring that up is because my mom was a single mom. Um, of course she has stress and she's dealing with all of this her whole life. And every time she went to the doctor with fibromyalgia symptoms and this and that, here's another pain pill, here's another pain pill. And these opioids changed the way that she thought and they changed her behavior. We're doing much better than than uh, than then giving uh, Vicodin and Celebrex, um, but I think if somebody were to show would have shown her earlier on about how to help her body make a better decision, things could have been a little bit easier for her. So that's why I'm doing this video letter 
but um, fascia research. And uh, this comes from uh, Denise Hawking and it's about fibronectin. So fibronectin is a soluble polymerized insoluble, um, sorry, la, la, la. soluble fibronectins are polymerized into insoluble extracellular matrix fibrils via cell dependent process that can be rapidly up and up and up regulated and down regulated. In vivo fibronectin matrix polymerization is a continuous process with as much as 50% of fibronectin matrix undergoing turnover every 24 hours. So, so this is different than the collagen and the elastin in our body, but actually collagen and elastin, they, they need that pressure sensing in order to have the fibroblasts make either collagen or elastin. They need to have that mechanical um, input. Um, so where am I going with this? Oh. Fibronectin fibrils and connective tissue matrix transduce signals from contracting skeletal muscle to local blood vessels to increase blood flow. And maybe that's something you already know, but the general public doesn't. And um, fibronectin fibrils of adult connective tissue plays a dynamic role in regulating both vascular responses and vascular tone. I probably don't need to share any more about that sort of thing with you, but um, the greater the interstitial pressure is, uh, that changes lymphatic flow. So when we give somebody uh, uh, self-care and we say, here's a program and you're using a roller or a tool or something, and this is why you're doing it, it's important for education like you're doing with Laura Moore mostly, but um, to put it in such a language that they understand. And, and why is medicine talking about mechanoreceptors when that doesn't translate very well? It's a pressure sensor. Who, who doesn't know what a pressure sensor is, but who knows what a mechanoreceptor is? It's, the language is crazy and it needs to be more people language, not science language. You know what I mean? Okay. I lost my train of thought, but hang on a second. Okay, two more things to share with you and then um, mm, gotta let you go. Uh, so let's see, uh, share my screen. And NCCIH is the National Center for Complement and Integrative Health. Now, Helen Legevin, who runs this, uh, she did some incredible studies earlier on about how a needle for acupuncture, it goes into the tissue. And um, now this is, this, is, this is the reason I wanna bring up this tribology thing because we're not using that in our language, but the way that the tissues stuck around that needle and spun around like spaghetti is really important. And we're not speaking about tribology and how surfaces interact with each other. And if we started to do that, it's not a mechanical process, it's very adaptable and, it, and, and people need to know about it because it changes our behavior and it changes the way the brain works. So in, in this uh, different uh, group that was there, Lorimer Mosley, obviously you know him, he talked, brilliant. Um, Alexander Chesler, Molecules and Cells for Touch and Pain. So an incredible uh, engineering student uh, who is very smart, but she is PZO2 um, breast or deficient. So when you blindfold her and take her away vision, she, she can't even find her own nose. Um, that, is, that is a sensory problem, not a movement disorder. And I'm, I'm convinced my mom was in there and I'm convinced that her pain up until the point of her severe decline was, was a signal from the body of, I need something, I need something, I need something. Not exercise, not pill, not a sleeping pill. Okay, so meta hot hawk. So there's another uh, person that was in this uh, um, lecture series giving five minute abstract of 
brilliant work. And I read her papers. So, so the thing is, um, these traction forces, she's talking about traction forces. I'm talking about, can we speak a plain language like tribology and explain to people that this and this and compression and vibration all are interplane in our body and we can do a lot to help. So uh, she has a lot of information of how that's coupled with brain development and neuronal development. And, and we know, we know from Marion Diamond and all of her uh, work that she did with uh, mice and rats is that the more stimulating environment that you give them, the more glial cells that they have. And when she dissected Albert Einstein's brain, she found out, wow, this guy has the high density of glial cells. So what we take in from the environment is extremely important. And we can do that through touch. Now, obviously I'm, well, you don't know. I'm a massage therapist. This is what I do all day. But the average person thinks it's kind of voodoo. And okay, fine. But anytime that I get a chance to work with somebody's body, if it can listen and we can listen, we can start making a difference. And this is where the rant comes in. And I, and I told myself not to do this. So I'm backing off a little bit. I'm going to share the screen with you about Mark Rutland and osteoarthritis and end with nitric oxide because we talked about nitric oxide in uh, that paper with fibronectin. Fibronectin is stimulated with nitric oxide. So here's the last one. I feel like a, a I feel like one of those comedy shows. In just a little bit, I'll get to the the kicker. Uh, but Mark Rutland's information is coming up. Joan Verkinos talked about the endothelial lining of animals that went up into space. And of course, we can't do this with humans because the animal comes back from space and they're sacrificed and we can look inside their body. And we find out that a normal endothelial cells change after being in space. Now, is this because of microgravity? Is this because of radiation? I don't know. But what she's saying is the not normal um, endothelial cells it changes the shear forces as the blood flows through. And this changes nitric oxide. So if we don't produce as much nitric oxide gas, those blood vessels don't open up. And we know in glymphatics with the brain, if the brain is not resting well, and those glymphatics don't open up those, those channels so that the brain can wash itself, we have problems with the fabric of the, the brain. So tribology will go you can read that at your leisure if you want to um she's she does some great lectures about just moving but the reason that you sing probably and you love to sing that vibration vibration is mechanoreception and vibration creates more nitric oxide so a lot of yogis will hum mm. somebody that has parkinson's if they hum or gargle more nitric oxide. And we also know from a lot of studies, um, there's a, a lot of cyclists that cycle really hard with Parkinson's or they box and then they feel better. That nitric oxide, it's changing the body. But also I think the mechanoreceptors are changing. I know that's me. Uh, so here's Mark's information. You could probably just start this in the beginning and go back to the <laughs> start it from the beginning and go right to the end if you want okay Brian I'm done but here's the thing he's from New South Wales I don't know where that is from yours uh, um, place but he comes to Sweden and he teaches chemistry Mark Brutland um, he has told me in an email that yes Alyssa uh, massage therapy is tribology and it is the action of it but not even Helen Langevin is talking about tribology for force mechanisms and, and changing the fascia or, or how the senses are being interpreted. And I, and I think that's, that's really something that could. So um, here they're talking about 
the same thing that massage therapy talks about, the biological lubricant that provides cushioning and low friction during articulation is a viscous non-Newtonian fluid, also known as synovial fluid. It contains biomolecules, including hyaluronin, big word in massage therapy and fascia, lubricant and phospholipids. So where does it come in with chatting about He, he uses atomic force microscopy. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that or if that's anything that's ever used to measure. Um, he talks about disease cartilage. Oh, low and high molecular weight hyaluronin. And this is very similar to what um, Carla Stecco's brother, Antonio Stecco, is uh, doing in um, Rochester, New York. And I'll put a link in there, but he's talking about the densification, um, just like, you know, tau proteins or something like that. When, when hyaluronin densifies, it becomes a lot more plibig in Swedish, or a lot more sticky and a lot more not, not lubricating. So then biomechanics changes. Sorry, I think I have to go back to the very beginning. This one was not so classy, was it? Discussion. Oh, yeah, there it is. Okay, A, biotribolical implications. Films that form exhibit a similar structure to the animal first layer previously reported. The high roughness and dissipation of the surface films are not consistent with the well-ordered bilayer structure, but instead with the formation of highly dissipated, soft, disordered um, lipid hyaluronin film. Um, leads to a in film thickness and a change in film morph morphology. And when, when they're talking about the film, I mean, this is inside the person. And we talk about this with articular cartilage and, and ink in Swedish brosk. Once that change happens, that glassy appearance no longer is glassy and the friction is higher, which is causing inflammation. So tribology can, can morphology of films there. There, that's really what I wanted to say. Tribology is a scientific word along with how surfaces slide and when they do slide, that produces this. When they don't slide, it produces this. And there's a whole cascade of uh, chemicals and electrical signals based on that physical pressure, stimulus. I think I'm done. I don't know if I hit my target, but there's your video letter. And hello from Sweden and uh, good luck on your PhD. And if you could, please look into fascia and uh, keep, keep educating people because like, like, like Jesus, you, you teach people how to fish and then they're never hungry, right? Okay. I'm not religious. Just thought it would be funny.